Hi, welcome to Get Used to It. I'm Sheila Kuehl, your host or hostess or whatever you like, your um, guide through uh, the intricacies of our talk. And today we've got three wonderful guests. We're talking about biography, uh, people who write them, people they write about. And uh, as you'll see, uh, there's a theme here in terms of the subject of the biographies as well as our biographers. So let me get right to the introductions. Um, here directly to my left, uh, Stuart Timmons, who is an author, a historian, and president of the board of the uh, One Institute and Archives. And for purposes of our discussion today, here invited because he's the author of The Trouble with Harry Hay, which is uh, a biography of uh, one of our guiding lights in the community, Harry Hay, who recently passed away. Um, welcome, Stuart. Glad you're here. Thank you so much. Um, our next guest, David Crittenden, is a writer, a teacher, a musician, and a board member of the One Institute, uh, who is at the moment, and probably for a great deal of the past, uh, working on a novel, a fictional biography, uh, based on the life of Bessie Smith. Welcome, David. Oh, thank you very much. Happy you're here. And our third guest, Michelle Court, a writer, editor, um, and reason for her invitation here today, uh, the author of uh, Soul Picnic, The uh, Music and Passion of Laura Nero, uh, a biography that only recently came out, but also, as we know, uh, was the co-writer of uh, The End of Innocence with Chastity Bono. Welcome, Michelle. Pleasure to be here, Sheila. Thank you. Um, Stuart, let's start with you. I'm interested in sort of um, the background of a person that leads them to write such a biography. What is your your history of uh, writing and activism? Well, I had been uh, involved in writing first when I was a UCLA student, um, uh, more than 20 years ago. And at UCLA, we started what we didn't realize was the first GLBT uh, college paper uh, in the U.S. Uh, it was called 10 percent. Uh -huh. Whatever I was studying, which happened to be film, uh, held no uh, such allure and excitement as being able to get in on the ground floor, covering things like the 1979 March on Washington, the first one, uh, uh, in, in a paper. At that point, there wasn't even a gay paper in LA. Frontiers wasn't in publication yet. So when the chance came along uh, about uh, seven years later to write about Harry Hay in the growing but still very limited gay publishing world, it was just a chance I couldn't pass up. Now, why would you choose biography? I mean, I understand journalism is sort of quasi-accurate or factual. At least that's the claim. Um, but it's about news and events, m mostly, not necessarily people. It's a very um, different kind of writing uh, for the community and the larger audience. Why biography? Well, this project, I'd have to say, chose me. Uh, I had written enough about gay issues for um, 10% and then for a little paper in San Diego called Update and a few pieces for The Advocate. Uh, the offer to write this biography of Harry Hay came through uh, Sasha Allison uh, of Allison Publications and Richard Labonte of the great uh, Different Light Bookstore who had been talking at, a, a gay, uh, a, at the gay booth of the American Bookseller Association convention where a, a lot of big books are born and book deals are born. And this was a little teeny deal. There was hardly any money involved in it, but they were talking about what was needed in the, in the emerging market uh, for gay bookstores, and they were talking about the lack of biography for uh, people who had been involved in the movement, especially going back as far in time as Harry, who began organizing in 1948 and who was born in 1912. So his life was a chance to tell uh, the 20th century story through a gay viewpoint of a really pivotal figure. Why don't you um, tell us a little more, or a lot more, about Harry Hay? Because who knows? I mean, the, the show is seen across the country, and people may not be as familiar with Harry uh, even you know, here in California. Well, yeah, it's, it's amazing the reasons for that. Uh, Harry is known widely as the father of gay liberation. Uh, the subtitle of my book, The Trouble with Harry Hay, is the founder of the modern gay movement. Uh, he took an oath of anonymity with his fellow co-founders uh, 
to never reveal who started an organization called the Mattachine Society, mm -hmm. which became uh, uh, widespread starting in 1951, forming chapters first in LA, then up to Berkeley, to Boulder, and as far as Buffalo. Uh, eventually, the West Side Discussion Group in New York City was uh, an, a, a, a gay group that had been meeting with political aspirations uh, for 20 years before the Stonewall Rebellion. Uh, but that oath of anonymity made this, um, uh, which, which was done to protect the other uh, Mattachine Society founders, one of whom was a school teacher, another who uh, was a fashion designer, their livelihoods were threatened because in those days it wasn't just gay teachers who were vulnerable, but really anybody. Mm -hmm. But Harry also had um, his own political concerns. Yes, indeed. Because I think one of the other very interesting things about Harry is that um, as a member of the Communist Party, the, the flack that he ran into kind of on both sides of his fence. Right, right. And, and uh, did for till the end of his days and after his death. Uh, <laughs> Harry's <laughs> communism has been heavily denounced by uh, uh, such uh, gay community people as Andrew Sullivan uh, and uh, uh, anyone in the right wing. Uh, uh, Harry be came from a, a privileged and affluent family. His father was a mining engineer who had worked for Cecil Rhodes, uh, operating gold and diamond mines in South Africa. He operated a copper mine in Chile. Against the privilege of all of that, young Harry Hay, who was extremely bright, uh, found himself drawn to what he called the siren song of revolution. In the early 30s, after the uh, stock market crash and the onset of the Great Depression, which wiped out his family's uh, wealth as, as well as many other people's, communism and socialism made sense as a uh, theory to change things. It had another very powerful pull for him in that it talked about organizing, it talked about strategizing, it actually taught these as disciplines and whatever you're going to say about uh, communists, they, are, they were very well organized and perhaps more so in this country than over in the USSR. <laughs> uh, so those qualities of, and skills that he was learning, in the back of his mind he was always applying to this group, at that point he was only calling us people like us, mm -hmm. temperamental types. Temperamental types. Sensitive guys. Uh -huh. And so organizing the Mattachine Society, did that reflect in, in some way what he had learned from his work with the Communist Party? I mean, there was an element, there were, you know, cells that were not d allowed to know another cell so that you couldn't turn in a fellow person. Exactly. I mean, it's really interesting because there was such disopprobrium Yes. for communism and such disopprobrium, probably even worse, for people like us, as he put it. Right. Uh, well, certainly the, the structure, uh, I, I'm sure, was highly influenced by the way the, the CPUSA, the Communist Party of the United States, was set up. Uh, for uh, identical concerns. The State Department, as, as some historians have agreed, you know, jokingly, the only thing the State Department and the Communist Party agreed on was that homosexuals were a security risk. Uh, <laughs> and there was a strategy that was similar to protect uh, the Communist Party, which had a secret cell structure, and the um, uh, Mattachine Society, which had a similar one. Although Harry Hay and Chuck Rowland and some of the other uh, late Mattachine Society founders told me that actually the cell structure was inspired by the Masons, the Masonic mm. Order, which is huh. much older than the Communist Party, yes. and had a quality that was very important to all of those people in those days, which was the quality of being a brotherhood, an almost mystical brotherhood, looking at uh, a gay person's nature uh, and what made them different in life was something that could pull them together as sort of a tribe with a purpose in life and with social roles that had not yet been uh, uncovered, let alone respected by society. There was the society. also the, the, um, the underpinning of the notion of a need for liberation, which is a very political 
concept, and I don't mean in the electoral sense, but um, the notion that came out of the idea of revolution, that Absolutely. it isn't just assimilation, it isn't just getting people to feel that we're okay, but to organize for a civil rights kind of movement or... Yes, well, to, to, to affirm the, the, the nature of an oppressed minority, to actually acknowledge that gay people were oppressed was something many gay people did not agree on mm -hmm. in 1948 and 1950. Uh, probably the average homosexual thought, well, yes, I'm sick, I can't help it. Uh, it's a compulsion, it's a weakness was one of the big terms Harry and many of the, because I interviewed hundreds of people who knew him and others from that time uh, to make sure that I wasn't getting just one man's point of view. Um, but the idea of this being a weakness mm -hmm. that could be overcome, which is an old line Christian mm -hmm. uh, attitude about sex in general. You're mm -hmm. not supposed to enjoy it, you're not supposed to feel it. Uh, so uh, uh, that uh, understanding that this was an oppressed group and uh, that they had a potential to organize was really his key and probably his greatest historical influence in what we now call the GLBT rights movement. He gets credit, Harry Hay more than anyone else, for picking up the term minority, cultural minority, and applying it to a group which had formerly been classed as deviates, mm -hmm. as people who are mentally ill, or as people who just were weak. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll of course come back to talking about Harry, but I want to talk to David um, for a minute about, it, it's a whole different genre, this um, uh, fictional biography. Um, tell me a little, though, about your writing and you know artistic background I know you're a man of many talents well my main interest in arts probably started out in music I've been following that most of uh, my life I was very influenced and affected by uh, church music I grew up in a church that was very southern southern baptist church and so my grandparents had a big effect on me and uh, it's been a lifelong thing and I think maybe another lifelong thing was my grandparents because they often talked about growing up in Tennessee and their experiences there. And since they were born hmm, like 1870s, my grandfather, late 1870s, they go way back in terms of history. Mm -hmm. And so on my, one of my interest in Bessie Smith kind of dovetailed uh, surprisingly with my childhood because in the back of my mind I would often hear my uh, grandparents' voices around the edges of the story as I got into uh, Bessie Smith's life. Another profound link, probably for me too, is being part of the uh, Mississippi um, Voter Registration Project in 1964. Right. Because it threw me into uh, um, just an unbelievable uh, emotional, political, uh, historical drama, uh, which I don't know gave me a, gave me a piece of my own past that I didn't have. Uh, I remember as a child always asking my grandparents to take me to Tennessee or let's go down south. I wanted to see the scene of all these stories and they said, oh no, we're not taking you there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the subtext of that was, as a, since I grew up in Illinois, as a northern boy, I was not, uh, maybe I wasn't safe to be there. Mm -hmm. And of course I grew up in the era of Emmett Till and all this, Right. but they they, you know, they had this. They carried this knowledge, which just absolutely entranced me. And when uh, I got involved with a writing group through a friend, uh, I did not really follow writing seriously, except as a reader. Mm -hmm. I got um, I got hooked. And uh, uh, Patricia Cohan's writing group in Santa Monica, probably you know, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And somewhere in that group, I found the uh, biography of Bessie by. Chris Albertson, which was written in the 60s, which is uh, the definitive biography of her. Uh, he was a European writer on jazz. He's been living in this country most of his life. And it was just um, haunting to me. I read it, and I couldn't seem to get out of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, for some reason, after I finished it, I started reading it again. I almost huh. never do that to uh -huh. a book. And I couldn't figure that out. So I just stayed in this world. Somehow the world that was created there just entranced me. I also should say that because of this early experience with my grandparents and just my growing up, I've always been interested in kind of the backstory, the story behind the story. Sure. 
And I've been very fascinated with the story of black musicians and bl general black American history as it's pulled into general American history, uh, just as a, you know, as a personal, or not, right. or not. And Bessie Smith is kind of a, or not, because although everybody knows her name, uh, very few people actually listen to her music. Like me, I was not someone who listened to her music a great deal. I was influenced by a lot of other stuff, you know, more, you know, quote, modern stuff, more like jazz or rock and roll or soul mm -hmm, or sure. other stuff. But after I read her story, then I listened to her music anew, and I found a resonance there that uh, was never existed. But your novel's not really just about her adult life. No. What really interested me was the fact that in his biography, what is complete as it is, um, no one even really knows what her exact birth date was. I mm -hmm. mean, that's still up for grabs. Was she born in 1894? Was it 1896? Uh, there are precious, you know, small amounts of information about her beginning years, just anecdotal stories. She sang, she sang on the street with her brother Andrew. Uh, okay. Uh, her parents were dead by the time she was eight or ten, depending on what chronology you want. Uh, she had a number of brothers and sisters. They lived in great poverty in Chattanooga. Uh, her life dovetails, the beginning of her, her musical career and her life dovetails with, you know, probably the scene, not probably, the scene of the most active oppression of black Americans in America, you know, after slavery, which was the whole influence of uh, segregation and Jim Crow laws, and of course lynch law, which was rife in the United States from mm, about 1910 on through, uh, probably not really ending until the 50s. Mm -hmm. And we still get echoes of it even, even now, you know, circa, you know, the, the terrible uh, dragging death in Texas. It's, right. you know, it's, uh, it's locked into uh, you know America's story. It's a bad, it's a bad piece of America's story. And um, since part of the theme of this show goes around sexuality and uh, either you know blended sexuality or questionable or clear or whatever, mm -hmm. is that an aspect of your um, thoughts about Bessie as well? Oh yeah, um, Bessie is quite well known uh, for being a person who would we call by. Uh, she had many relationships with uh, other women. Uh, she seems to have had, I guess you, one might say, the most uh, continuing relationships with men. She was married to a man, Jack G. She also had a, a very long relationship with a man named Richard Morgan, who was Lionel Hampton's uncle. Mm -hmm. uh, that was in the last uh, maybe eight or nine years of her life. But all during this period, she had many relationships with um, women, people she knew in show business and without. Of course, there's also the uh, story, which I also write about in my book, a relationship with Ma Rainey, mm -hmm. which I also believe was a romantic and sexual relationship. And I further believe that because Bessie was so interested in personal freedom. I mean, her story is, is very compelling in many, on many levels, but I think maybe most compelling because she seemed to be someone who just couldn't stand to be kind of controlled or held back. It didn't matter to her that she was poor, that she was too dark skinned, that she was behind, you know, everybody else would feel, you know, she had nothing going for her. She seemed to always believe, uh, hey, you know, I have it happening, I'm going to do this, and seemed to follow her, more than her heart, also her own spirit and her own feelings. So if that led her to same-sex um, liaisons or relationship, then she was going to have them. It was going to be her business, how she was going to take care of it. And she didn't seem to care much, who knew? I mean, she tried to keep her uh, affairs away from her husband, uh, but uh, it was well known at the time. These affairs were well known certainly in show business and I think also in the larger black community um, because of uh, gossip columns. Not, of course, not in, nearly as complete as the kind of stuff we have And now. did you have a sense that it was, uh, that it cost her anything except for sort of, you know, personally needing to hide something or not wanting to hide it or uh, just in terms of <laughs> career or? I don't think it cost her in terms of her career. 
Uh, I think then, I think uh, in terms of black America, America in general, people's sexuality was much more private, more their own business. Right. And I think there's a big strain of that uh, in, in black community still. It's, you know, it is kind of my business, not yours. Mm -hmm. um, some people might take that as, a, as, as you know, some, somewhat of a hiding, but I think in terms of communities of color, it's not, it may not be seen primarily as a political act. That the, per, that the political and the personal uh, kind of diverge, but they also coalesce in individual lives that are lived as people, uh, you know, see best for them. Huh. Yeah. Well, Michelle, there's a theme of music going on here, too. <laughs> um, your, uh, your biography of Laura Nero is, uh, has been out for a while, and uh, people are very excited. Um, obviously because they love Laura Nero and because they want to always know more about a person uh, that they admire or you know uh, for whom they're fans but tell us a little bit about your writing background I mentioned just one of your credits but uh, that sort of brought you up to the writing of this book well I I sort of fell into journalism uh, in the late 70s I'd, I'd studied art history and arts management I thought I'd be administering an art museum, but uh, decided I didn't really like that as much as when I got a job at a magazine and I just loved it. And uh, one of the first things I was interested in writing about actually was, was music. And, um, and, and, my fr and my second editing job was with a magazine called Songwriter. Hmm. So it all kind of uh, fits in from my early uh, experience. But then I, I also was very interested in women's sports and just women's issues in general and, and wrote a lot for um, Ms. Magazine in the 80s. Uh, in the 90s I had some editing jobs but continued to freelance and uh, started writing for The Advocate. So I was writing more about gay artists and so I guess it all comes together when um, Laura Nero dies um, in uh, five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and. I was a huge fan of hers from, I always say from day one, <laughs> October of 1966 when I heard Wedding Bell Blues on AM radio in LA, <laughs> and I'm talking about Laura Nero's version of it, not Fifth Dimension. Right. And I was heartbroken when she died, and uh, a week later uh, a friend said, we well, should write a book about her. And I thought, oh, I was going to read that book, <laughs> not write it. And so I had to wrap my mind around that concept, and I'd always wanted to write a biography. I was really, especially in the, in the, in the 70s, I was very into reading biographies of women because it's the beginning of the women's movement and that inspiration. And, and women artists and writers, Virginia Woolf and uh, Romaine Brooks, Carson McCullers, Jane Bowles, those are the, the biographies that really stand out to me from that time. Um, I was telling you this story that was it brings me back because I leaped on the Laura Nero idea and, and contacted an agent and wrote a proposal and, and got in on the ground floor on this story. And I re had remembered years ago reading something about Jane Bowles and I thought, wow, someone should write a biography about her. <laughs> and I just kind of had it in my mind and then like within the year, this book came out that was a biography in her. I thought, oh, if you have this idea, you have to act on it. Right. And fortunately, I was there. And, and acted on it and, and got a contract and I was supposed to have it done in a year and it took me three um, and it was a total labor of love. I mean, well tell us something about Laura Nero. Uh, well I if mean you, if you don't know of Laura Nero you should. Let's start by saying that because right. she was um, one of the greats in, in, in pop music in, in the last um, half, of, uh, half century really and uh, as I said, in 1966, that was when she made her debut. Um, she was from New York, and she d combined a lot of influences in her music in ways that people hadn't combined them before, uh, whether it was classical, jazz, um, the doo-wop and soul music that she'd grown up with, rock and roll, and she just saw no limits and just combined it all in a very unique style that became very influential for other people. And at first, uh, I mean, she had her own little hit, at least in certain regions of the country, with Wedding Bell Blues. But she made her real success, financially at least, um, with other people recording her songs. Mm -hmm. And at one point in, in 1969, November of 1969, three songs that she wrote were in the national top ten in wow. one week. Wow. 
and it was um, and when I die by blood sweat and tears Wedding Bell Blues by Fifth Dimension and Eli's Coming by mm -hmm. Three Dog Night. Mm -hmm. And the other song that people have heard a lot about were, was, um, well, Stone Soul Picnic was a hit for Fifth Dimension and um, Stony Inn for Barbara mm -hmm. Streisand. Mm -hmm. But she was recorded by, you know, there was just, oh, dozens of cover songs, uh, cover versions of her songs. Mm -hmm. And, but she also had a tremendous sort of cult following of people who loved hearing her voice. She was very dramatic. As a performer, going to see her was like going to church. It was, or temple in my case. <laughs> um, but it was a, a spiritual experience and no one who saw her back then uh, forgets it. And she had these kind of five really great albums going into the early 70s and then kind of disappeared for a few years. She'd gotten married, she came back in the mid-70s, um, then she got pregnant, and then she disappeared for really another 10 years. Mm -hmm. And just doing one album in that time. Well, so she lost a couple of generations of fans by, by disappearing. And when she came back, really starting in the mid-70s, her, her music went from being very intense to mellower and mellower, and she became sort of a I always like to think of her as an eco-feminist, very attached to the earth and trees, and, mm -hmm. and gone from living in, in New York and writing this very urban music to writing literally songs about trees and um, you know, the spirits she felt around her. And a lot of people kind of didn't get it, or mm -hmm. I felt I was on the journey with her all the way. Uh, the other thing that uh, I learned in the late, se late 80s, excuse me, when she started performing again, was that she was now with a woman, mm. which was kind of stunning. At the time, she always had a tremendous amount of lesbian and, and gay male fans. And, and she had a, a famous song called Emily mm -hmm. that uh, a lot of people wondered if it was a love song to a woman, um, although you could take it in different ways. So maybe it shouldn't have been surprising that she was with a woman. But meanwhile, she had written all these very intense romantic songs about men. She had been married, she'd had a child. She never uh, formally came out, but she did remove gender from her lyrics uh -huh. <laughs> from the late 80s on, so uh -huh. she was a little coy about it. And um, she was a tremendous influence on other um, songwriters and performers. And I keep finding over and over just people that say, oh yeah, Laura Nero, even in, unsurprising, in surprising places like uh, the guitarist from R.E.M. Uh -huh. or the, um, the drummer for Los Lobos, uh -huh. you know, besides the women singer-songwriters. And I feel that there's a sort of crusade aspect to my book of you uh, youngsters today, whether you're performers or songwriters or just fans, should know where this music, this singer-songwriter music, comes from. It comes from Laura Nero. It comes, you, you know it comes from Joni Mitchell. You know it comes from Carole King. But you should know also that it comes from Laura Nero. Well, it's interesting to me, because I really want to ask all three of you, and um, it, again, kind of, why biography? Um, I, I may be asking an obvious question, but you know, there's a lot of ways to tell stories. And I'm assuming that you think about the audience, you, not whether or not you're going to sell books. That's not what I mean. But what's the experience of the reader? What is it you want a reader to get? I mean, why is one person's story the key to something for a reader? Well, I, I really uh, picked up on what Michelle has said about the biography she read. Uh, during her formative years. It, 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 biography was a, a compelling and fascinating genre for me before I understood my sexuality and became an activist. Mm. Uh, I was always searching for, well, how do you do it? How do people live a life at all, let alone with a certain kind of uh, uh, underlying nature that might you know, be, be uh, needing to be expressed? When I had the opportunity to write about a gay man in his 70s who had uh, been in many ways the founder of this huge movement, uh, it was an opportunity I couldn't pass up in terms of uh, providing that for myself as well as for other readers. 
And uh, at the time of publication, and then recently since his death, many people have expressed an appreciation for just being able to get a sense of what life was like during that period for gay, uh, for gay people. Uh, so, so biography has a, uh, a very special place uh, in terms of being able to uh, figure out uh, um, a, a sort of a model for, for well, life. It's, it's a living. story of the time, too. I yeah. mean, biography gives you an opportunity, I assume. I mean, I think uh, looking at what you're looking at in uh, Bessie's life, even in a fictionalized version, must be a lot about sort of the surroundings of it. Always felt to me like it's what what do I relate to in this person? How is this person better than me so it gives me something to aspire to? What is the milieu of this person so I get some history but also maybe familiarity or maybe not? I mean... Yeah, the history is... Well, I mean, history, I mean, you just say the word sounds a little dull, but when you realize everybody lives in it, I mean, we're living in our his historical time too. I mean, it's, it's always fluid. So in talking about somebody like Bessie, uh, for me to go back and look at photographs, read articles, read about other people at that time, it's just incredibly eye-opening because I have to think about, well, I couldn't do X, Y, and Z in that time. What would be the parameters of my life? Mm -hmm. And I think realizing what real parameters are. I mean, what would it be like if I walk out of my house today and it's really lynch law, like the kind of things that, that she um, was up against. Uh, what if I walk out of my house today and all of a sudden there's signs up on uh, Wilshire Boulevard instituting, you know, the new Jim Crow regime. Uh, these were, the, th these were the, the billboards of her childhood. Well, in the context yeah. of her music, too, I mean, Strange Fruit. Mm -hmm. is about, well, you know, yeah, seeing Billie people Holiday, hanging right. in trees um, exactly. that, yeah. uh, you know, that, uh, that Billy sang. And, and, there's, and, and she's commenting in the, in the early 40s or late 30s when she right. made that recording right. about a situation that had been coming forward since Bessie Smith's childhood. And, and, I, and ironically, too, Bessie Smith had been a big influence on Billie Holiday, although it might not be apparent, but if you listen to them, you really see right. how much uh, one influence the other. Well, yeah. I, um, I saw a play not long ago called um, Imaginary Friends, <coughs> uh, which I think is on uh, in, in New York now. And uh, Cherry Jones and Swoozie Kurtz played uh, Mary McCarthy and Lillian Hellman, uh, and who had a, a, a great uh, contretemps, um, uh, well publicized in the time, though I think it was mostly Mary McCarthy's doing against, you know, Lillian Hellman. But the interesting way the play was, that Nora Ephraim drew the play, was that uh, Mary McCarthy accused Lillian Hellman of stating that something was true when she had fictionalized it. And Lillian Hellman retorts in the play, well, you're writing something that you say is fiction, but it's completely taken from the lives of your, you know, Radcliffe sisters, uh -huh. and they were totally upset with you because you didn't even thinly disguise it. Um, and it so this is really sort of the elemental um, uh, tension uh, oh, yeah. in the play as they, you know, as they've drawn it. And I have to wonder, I mean, how do you choose what to tell about this person? How do you know what you've chosen you know, it's supposed to be true, yours is not supposed to be true, and yet people are going to think, boy, there's a lot behind that. Yours are supposed to be true, and yet I don't, obviously I trust that everything is. How do you choose what you write about to show this picture of a person? Well, I think it's, it's artistic choices that um, David's talking about um, parameters, and I think that we s probably, uh, Stuart and I set ourselves the parameter that it had to be historically accurate. And David's parameter is sort of emotional accuracy, I would think, as a, as a fiction writer mm -hmm. and, a, and a kind of historical truth. And so I think that that's an artistic choice. But the fact is, is that when you write a biography, even though it's truth, it has to be a good story. Mm -hmm. And you have to make all these choices you have to choose the story, the, like the through line, and, and do that because you could start a biography with the moment of someone's birth and 
them being weighed by the nurses. <laughs> and, um, and then every day of their life, they wake up, you know, the alarm goes off, they wake up, they go brush their teeth, what they ate for breakfast. There's a zillion moments in a person's life. So you choose the ones that, uh, that, that tell like a sort of a thematic story. And, and I, I said at the end of my book, I, this is a story of Laura Nero's life, it's not the story. Someone else could have written it completely differently. Yeah, I agree, you have to find that story that has drama and has tension. And another thing that I found that was really amazing, the, the quality that people talk about in novels where it takes on its own life and it's writing and you're not necessarily writing, it's the story getting told. I wound up finding characters in Harry Hay's life that were so fascinating. Uh, his mother uh, was an incredibly strong force in his life as following the stereotype of gay men and their mothers. And you know, there it is and it, and it was true and why not go with that. Uh, his um, uh, lover after the Mattachine Society uh, uh, fell apart was a not very pleasant guy. He was really sort of a, of a villain and, and sort of a, a very controlling, uptight, very 1950s homosexual. Harry Hay was the liberated visionary, but he hooked up with someone who was uh, very, very uh, straight-laced and uptight and closeted. And when I did the interview with this guy, it was, uh, you know, whatever the day is, the third Sunday or second Sunday in June, it was Gay Pride Day. He had no idea, and I was thinking, what an irony. So mm -hmm. finding mm -hmm. these characters oh. and finding how they drive the story and uh, how these characters, who are all real people, can describe things and tell on uh, the person you're writing about, especially if they're still alive, which was my situation, which can be sensitive, you're able to really give a full portrait without having to denounce or psychologize. Michelle and I were talking about this earlier. It's very sensitive, uh, e even after someone's dead, dealing with how you, you give a full picture of them without being unnecessarily nasty and, and leaving a a negative record instead of a more uh, honest and full one. Well, the people at his memorial, several of them said they didn't think he should be deified because he had, you know, warts. And besides, he was he was annoyingly revolutionary in mm -hmm. a way. I mean, the, you know, to start the radical fairies. Oh yeah. Um, and to be insistent on, um, you know, gender bending and a number of things that were somewhat annoying to the more conventional gay community, if such a thing word can be used. you know, Then the and now, and it's one of the interesting things I actually learned about the uh, generation of what they call the homophile activists of the mid 20th century. All of them were larger than life, and all of them were kind of annoying. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, they had a, a toughness and an abrasiveness even that was the only thing that allowed them to break through all of this approbation. Uh, the, the laws in the 50s in California prevented more than three homosexuals from congregating in public, mm -hmm. advocating homosexuality, which would just be having a discussion group, uh, could get you uh, 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 in, in trouble with the law, and certainly fired. You know, being seen in a gay bar could get you fired, could get your picture in the paper. So having that kind of uh, um, tough personality was, was a necessity and a necessity that had to be illustrated in context to show actually what the story proved uh, its use was. Are there things that you decide not to put in the book, not because they weren't good stories, but because for the same thing, it's sort of like you don't want to go overly so that someone walks away with a negative image, but you don't want to deify this person. You're well, nodding. no, I mean, I made, I made some choices <laughs> of, of uh, some people that I thought it would hurt if I, you know, said maybe a little more truth than I, that I knew about. Um, but the other thing I was thinking was that I decided to take Laura Nero on her own terms rather than to be the critic saying, well, gosh, you really should have had different producers later in your career. I might right. have thought that personally, but I thought, I, I'm not writing, I, I wrote some criticism in, in a sense of like looking at her um, albums, but I really tried to look at her, was she satisfied with what she was doing in her life? 
And so I'd be, I'd be curious to ask you because David, in his book, is writing it first person. Right. So he he's certainly taking Bessie Smith on her own terms. You know? Yeah, it's gotten really kind of scary because I've I wrote pretty much what I thought was going to be it, and I just kind of lost faith in it and stopped for a while. Luckily, you know, I had Stuart and, and other friends around saying, "You've got to keep going on this. Got to keep going." And I. Uh, now uh, writing um, with um, uh, a teacher named Les Plesko over at UCLA, and he, after looking at my work, said, you know, the, the way you really ought to go with this, I think, is go first person, go right from her point of view, so you don't have to have the distance with third, and, and it, ma it makes it much more immediate. But it just scared me to death, because then I said, well, I have to really take on her full weight, her full emotional weight. And I found that a huge stretch to write, you know, to write as a man about a woman, to write about a famous woman. And then I start thinking, well, you know, I still worry about it. You know, well, am I doing this, am I doing justice to her? You know, yeah. by, by the liberties that I have to take as a novelist, how can I be sure that I'm being true? And I, and I think what Stuart was talking about, at a certain point, the writing does take over. The, I, at a certain point, I just kind of lose thought about whether I'm doing it right. I seem to just be channeling or pulling it out of somewhere that this is why this is the way I think it is, and it's um, it's you know it's a little bit it's, a, it's quite a bit yeah. flying without a net. I have I have the story you know I have I have these signposts of her story to to lift me up. But if I'm writing you know things that are said between her and a girlfriend or writing things that are said between her and her husband or her boyfriend in the last days of her life. You know, I'm clearly, you know, I'm clearly inventing everything. But I think w what, what ties it all together is that biography is an art, and the artist in one that needs to shape the story with the drama that comes to some sort of resolution and has some sort of message and resonance for a reader that uh, can be what pulls it together. It can help you make those decisions or help reinforce your instincts about when to hold back a bit of truth, when you have a duty to tell the truth, uh, how to show something uh, to really reveal character without being judgmental and uh, pretentious. It, it's, it's a very intimate thing, I found. It, it, was, it was really, I, I will always, have to admit that Harry Hay was one of the major relationships in my life. <laughs> it, you know, it took forever to write the book, and then I knew him forever. He, you know, I started this when he was in his late 70s, uh, 70s and he died uh, only recently uh, uh, after age 90. Uh, but we became extremely close. Uh, I, I know all of his family history, and I had that sensitivity about what can he take and what can he not take? Mm -hmm. And during the process, he was an explosive personality. He had a great big temper. Uh, very often I worried, am I gonna get uh, shut out mm -hmm. if I ask uh, not necessarily a certain question, but ask it in a certain way or at a certain time? So that, that aspect of following your, your ability to uh, artfully pull it together uh, I think was indispensable. I, I think every biographer runs into it. Well, I had, I had a different experience because I wrote about someone who'd passed away and someone I didn't know. And yet over the course of doing the research, I got to know, you know, almost everybody in her, major person in her life. It's really odd. Then you start feeling like you knew the person. Because yeah. you're, you know, you become friends with her family and her dear friends. It's, it's so strange. And did you find that some people at first, like, didn't trust you, and then they, <laughs> More they than that. didn't want to be left out? Then they all of a That's sudden exactly had to That's exactly what happened. That's exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, at the, at the very beginning, I got a proposal to her, um, her widow, essentially, uh -huh. Maria. And she considered it. In fact, it was the only one she was considering. And then uh, she participated in an, in an interview for the New York Times, not with me. And then they didn't like the article. And so then they said, yeah. no, don't want to do it. And I was told, which was not true, that not only she wasn't going to do it, but all these other people really close to Laura. Right. So I thought to myself, you know, I'm going to let it be for a while. I won't contact these people, but I'll contact all the other people that worked with Laura. And, you know, there's one friend of hers that would talk to me. 
and then I'll come back to them because they'll hear from the other people that I'm okay, I'm really harmless, and, uh, and that's what happened. And uh, her father was sort of the first one to kind of break the ice and, wow. and talk to me. And by the end of the project, not one person held out, except that her, her lover had died. Mm. Oh. Yeah, okay. so, uh, so I never got to talk to her. But, mm. but it's true, at the very end, people were jumping in like, uh-oh, if I don't right. talk, my voice won't be in it. Right. Hmm. Well, let me ask you um, sort of the next step. You were talking, you, you used the word message, Stuart. And um, I understand shaping a story historically. And I understand shaping it for, um, you know, for the dramatic effect and shaping the story. But again, and I'm, you know, fascinated by the issue of choosing to write about one person in order to illustrate something, one would think. It's not just about the person when you get down to it. It's about more than that. So I guess what what is it in, it, yeah. you know, in sort of even if it's a fantasy, that you think the reader gains from each of your books? Or what you hope they gain, or what you think happens to them reading it? What are they, why do they want to read about a person, and why do they want to read about this person? Well, I think that there is a motive for any, any gay person who's interested in, in their past and how we got to where we are to, to read a, a biography of a person who was a, a pivotal organizer. And I also think that uh, it's, it's like when I read biographies about uh, you know, film directors before I went to film school or uh, about uh, uh, writers before I became a writer. You're curious what happens along the way, what are the choices that people make, what's fate, what's determination. Y y to, to read a biography is a sort of a fascinating privilege, being able to see how you might live your own life and, and, and how life works to, to some degree. It, it's, it's, a, it's a life tool. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, that's, that's what I felt was, was something people would get. And one of the things that I, I found personally uh, after I finished this, because I was the first person who read this biography of Harry Hay that I wrote, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I found myself so um, comforted, really is the best word, by having written about a, a gay man who had fallen in love after age 50, who had lived to age 90, who uh, never had cosmetic surgery, uh, who took a great <laughs> photograph, always knew how to dress. Uh, he lived with real style and enthusiasm for 90 years. And the myth that I grew up with as a, a kid born in 1957 is they all commit suicide. All the gay men commit suicide. They become alcoholics or suicides or both. And that was a very strong myth for me growing up. So finding someone who had absolutely countered that was uh, a huge, huge, uh, you know, ribbon on the package. Hmm. Hmm. That's a good one, David. That's great. Yeah. What do you What do you hope that people will get from this, and why? I mean, why, Bessie Smith? Hmm. Well, that's a big question. Um, yeah, I don't want you to overthink the book. You're still writing it. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, for just well, for, for for me, I mean, I, it has so many levels with Bessie. I mean, I, I'm thinking, you know, as 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 uh, as her as a black woman, me as a black man, as a gay person, her as a, certainly a bi person. Uh, there's something there's something about our history in terms of being black people that uh, that we. I think we internalize a certain form of of oppression because. We know that um, we're being judged all the time by the, by the larger society, and I think I certainly internalized a lot of homophobia as a kid growing up because I certainly realized I was different. I wasn't completely sure why I was different, mm -hmm. uh, but I knew that I was. I certain, certainly saw things just off from what, uh, how other people saw them and felt. And I learned from Bessie, you know, that uh, you truly can just go from your heart, go from your feeling and get where you want to go and in doing so you you create something in yourself that other people relate to uh, I mean the thing that's very striking is you know all these years after her death I mean she died in 37 is people remembering her effect on audiences people would be transfixed people would walk out of the audience they would kind of sleepwalk 
to the stage. And she became a symbol of, uh, of power mm -hmm. and strength. And yet she's this extremely uh, bohemian and, and kind, of a, kind of a wild woman doing what she wants to do with kind of a messy life. But yet at the core, there's something about her which is uh, utterly uh, kind of indomitable and, and uh, heroic. Mm -hmm. and, I have, and I have to think that that's because she really followed this through line of her own, of her own desires and, and spirit all the way down. And it's a real lesson to, uh, to, to everybody that about you know, what you have to do to succeed or win or be. Uh, she's just saying, well, be yourself. Well, maybe one of the elements, really, of uh, sort of modernity doesn't really allow us to even use the word hero very much about people. And yet, one of the things I really resonate to that, because when, when I read biography, I think about sort of everyday people, in a sense, who may have a great talent or, or a lot of courage or just go with what they have, which is courage. Mm -hmm. uh, and they do attain heroic proportions without necessarily being worshipped you know, as a hero. I think that's the, if I may, since it's current, the resonance of the Lord of the Rings story, mm -hmm. which is that this uh, hobbit, I mean, what could be more ordinary, who, upon <laughs> whom greatness is thrust because, and says, okay, I'll do it because nobody else can do it, um, which is a great turning point in the book when they're all arguing about who should take on this great quest, and he says, well, I guess it has to be me. It's really about people that we connect with who are extraordinary but not so far out of our reach that we can't somehow be extraordinary as well. I mean, sitting here and listening to Laura's music today before the show, uh, it's an extraordinary talent, extraordinary voice, and yet I don't know whether that's that's just not the it of the story. Well, it's, it's interesting because I was a little afraid at the beginning of the project that learning about her life would ruin the music for me. <laughs> Because she was, her appeal was so much, seemed connected to her mystery. Because she was very private about her life and, you know, she was just on another planet. And it didn't happen, fortunately. And I think that people who are fans who read the book, they like uh, getting the 360 um, portrait of her mm -hmm. and, and finding that they still like her, you know, uh, beyond just what she meant to them and that she made all these choices in her life that were her art just was it's not about commerce it's about the art and it's so weird to hear that these days I think that's a real uh, inspiration to people right. who just see uh, what's called art in pop culture that is just all commerce and and not seeing someone who remained true to her muse to to her vision throughout her life and compromise less and less and less and less. Well, I think that um, the uh, issue of kind of what, you know, people are hopefully get out of this uh, really goes a lot to what we are kind of searching for. I think when people look browsing through a bookstore and we look at the, you know, back cover or whatever and think about what we want to buy, it's always about what will touch us. and. The combination, I think, of this feeling of it's real, you know, it's true. This is a real person. Nobody made them up. So if they did it, maybe I can do it too. Coupled with, they are larger than life. I mean, you know, Harry Hay, I mean, all three of these people are larger than life. And, um, but in a sense, biography says they're not larger than life. Here's their life. And therefore, you, you know, you can understand them, I guess. Um, so, as I said at the beginning to you, uh, there's only two minutes kind of remaining. <laughs> um, you should probably um, uh, say if there's anything you were thinking, oh, there's one more thing I wanted to add uh, about it. Well, I was just thinking about one of the questions you asked at the beginning. Um, the fact is, when we all grew up, we didn't know anything about gay people's lives or bisexual people's lives, it was a hidden thing, you know? It was in, in cells, you know, right. in, in mysterious cells. Right. So to be able to write biography and tell the truth about gay people's lives or bisexual people's lives is, is just a, a gift. 
You must yeah, it's a, it's been an amazing opportunity to to do that because uh, when I was at UCLA uh, before I uh, right around the time I met Harry Hay, there was an art history teacher who was furious during a lecture one day that people were saying things about Caravaggio and Michelangelo and how <laughs> dare they. And, and that was the kind of controversy. Your friends, the LA Times, would cover up someone being uh, gay or lesbian because... Right, as a supposed yeah, favor. Right, as a favor. And, and in some ways it was at the time because there were so many laws that could get uh, gay people in trouble. So it, it, it's, it's been, an, it, it, there, it, there's been an aspect of the civil rights movement to writing about, to writing an honest truth about someone's uh, personal and emotional life. Showing the emotional development of a gay person is, is been a, was a profound part of, I think, all of our, uh, our work. Um, and certainly with Harry, seeing how one person really can change the world, it does have that inspirational quality to anyone who reads it. Well, thank you all very much. Just a perfect wrap-up, Stuart, and you've all been um, very good to be here, Stuart and David and Michelle. And thank you for joining us as well. Um, we hope that you will uh, be interested, obviously, in these books and even beyond, because uh, it looks like uh, the truth about uh, gay and lesbian people's lives as told in biographies and uh, all the rest is here to stay, so get used to it.